Good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Eichenberger, Director of Marketing for Control Product Systems Group. I have with me my co-host, Tim Nordstrom, Technical Sales and Training Manager. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Tim's uh, camera decided to take the day off, so uh, we won't be seeing his uh, shiny face, but uh, the commentary is uh, the most important part. Uh, thanks for attending this educational opportunity. It's brought to you by CPSG University. And in the spirit of National Safety Awareness Month, Tim and I thought it'd be a good time to discuss safety in the automatic gate industry. We're scheduled for two hours today. We do have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this session, by the way, is being recorded. If that makes anyone uncomfortable, you are welcome to exit now, although I hope you don't. And because of the size of the session, we've muted your mics, but feel free to utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Tim and I will monitor that chat line and feed those questions to the group as appropriate. In addition, uh, we will follow up this session with the post-show webinar notes, some contacts, a recording of the session, uh, and links to more information. Uh, by the way, don't forget to collect your CEU credits uh, from the IDEA or ACI, should you be certified or accredited through one of those organizations, we'll include some details in that post-webinar email. Both Tim and I have a passion for this topic. We've uh, evangel evangelized this message since 2000 when some of the more significant requirements entered the industry. In addition, Tim and I spend time with the AFA at their schools facilitating classes. Uh, the AFA does an absolutely fantastic job educating on this topic. We do have a thorough curriculum for you today. Some aspects will be left out due to time constraints, but we'll try to signal what those items are as we go along. And we could literally spend a whole day on this topic. And in some of those classes, for instance, AFA, we do. Uh, what we will do is educate and demonstrate a practical approach to satisfying the standards. Uh, we try to tee up actual situations that you may face in the field and offer recommendations as the industry is set forth. What, what we won't do <laughs> is give legal advice or suggest how you run your company. You know, that's not our intent here. We're not lawyers. Um, in addition, we're not here to recommend manufacturer's product. This is meant to be manufacturer agnostic. Many manufacturers are shown in the pictures. Uh, again, that's not meant to recommend those products or discourage you from using them. Uh, they're purely examples, as are the images, by the way. The images uh, used come from various sources. Uh, by the way, they don't come from a place of judgment rather they are being used purely for the sake of education again we're not judging the installers rather looking for areas of improvement in those images right uh tim did i miss any uh, disclaimers there no you got them all you covered them well we got the legal stuff out of the way all right very good let's uh advance the slide there um i think it's important to note that uh, some of this content comes from the IDEA and ACI study guides. Uh, those study guides are curated by these industry leaders um, working to not only educate its members, but to help shape industry standards. Um, and it's important they be recognized and, and quite frankly applauded uh, for their efforts and commitments to the industries and an um, incredible amount of work has gone into these study guides and the educational content that is put out to the industry. And uh, Tim, go ahead and advance. As previously mentioned, there are two main certification and accreditation organizations, uh, those being ACI, uh, Accreditation and Certification Institute, and the IDEA, the Institute of Door Education and Accreditation. Uh, I'd highly encourage everyone on this call to visit those websites, learn more about certification, and look for an opportunity to participate. Uh, we'll provide some contact information after the session today. Uh, and feel free to reach out to Tim or myself. We spend a fair amount of time working with these organizations. And if you'd like to learn more about certification, by all means, please reach out. So with that, 
Uh, Tim's going to kick off the training with ASTM F2200. Uh, I then will uh, jump in and cover UL325. So, Tim, take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. Again, uh, thank you very much for, for hopping on this. We appreciate uh, you coming here and trying to further your education. Um, this subject uh, has always been a little bit of a hot spot for the past uh, 18 to 20 years. Um, as Zach said, we're, we're very passionate about this. Um, we spent a lot of time educating people. We spent a lot of time educating ourselves. Uh, I would say Zach and I are both well versed in this subject, but we are not above learning. I know at the end of this uh, webinar today, I will have learned something from you guys. Please use the chat feature, please talk. One thing I always like to say, my disclaimer is, um, Zach and I did not write any of these documents. Our you know, intent here is to try to interpret and to try to educate to the best of our abilities on them. So I always say, don't shoot the messenger. I know some people get a little upset at some of the safety standards. They are here for good reason. They're certainly up for debate, but uh, we didn't write them. So, uh, um, and, and before I move on, last thing, what Zach said is, yes, absolutely. Feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out to Zach at any time with any questions. Um, I know a lot of the answers. The answers I don't know, I know people that have them, and I will do my absolute best to get them back to you. With that being said, let's move forward. Um, we are going to talk today about UL325 and ASTM F2200. My portion of this webinar is to talk to you about ASTM. The differences between these two documents is UL325 is really about the gate operator, how they're manufactured, and how they're installed. ASTM F2200 is about an automatic gate, a gate, excuse me, that's intended to be automated and fabricated and installed. So UL is about the gate operator, ASTM is about the gate in a nutshell. So, as I said, you know, um, actually, and you'll see uh, in Zach's thing, UL came, uh, came a couple years before ASTM. ASTM came out afterwards to kind of bridge some gaps um, between the gate and the operator itself. And they, they do a good job of, of um, talking with each other in concert. There's slight little differences in there. We will point those out. But the, for the most part, ASTM and UL complement each other. Compliance. All about compliance with these things. Both UL325 and ASTM, their main focus is to improve safety. Um, Zach and I, I'm sure there's many of you, we've been in this industry a long time. And you know, when we started, it was back in the days where the sole function was to move a gate. Um, that was great. We did a good job a long time ago of moving the gate. We had big gate operators that could move big, heavy gates. But Lord help you if somebody got in the way of them. So, UL and F2200 came along to, you know, we need to introduce a lot more safety measures into our industry. And they came along and they've done a good job. They've had a few hiccups along the way, but they've done a great job. But I don't want to say that the safety overlies the security of the automatic gate system. I mean, let's face it, most gates, not all, most gates are there. The end user wants some type of security. That's why they're having an automatic gate installed. But under no circumstances does bypassing safety standards trump security. They've got to go together. UL and ASTM are living, working documents that are always changing, always updating, trying to balance that, that very difficult and delicate balance between safety and security of the installation. And this slide right here, this bullet point, raise industry awareness. This is something that, you know, I never would have thought 20 years ago we'd be where we're at today on this. I mean, here we are talking about this subject, more and more people, we have a lot of people on this site, that, on this webinar, that tells me that the industry still is, you know, is desiring information about this. They wanna learn how they can provide to their end user a safe and secure installation. And that's the purpose of this. And, that shows you people that are on this webinar 
that you're the true professionals in this industry. You are here not just to put in another gate operator. You are here to learn how to do it better and do it safer. That only benefits our industry. Okay. Both of these documents are a voluntary standard. Um, that's really, you know, basically it's a legal distinction. I guess when it comes down to it, you are not required to be in compliance with these. It's not a good idea not to be, but they are not a law. Um, they don't carry the force of law. These were created by our industry rather than governments doing that. Who knows our industry better, us or the government? We know it better. We know it. We stepped in and to try, and to this day, we update these standards to try to continually improve the safety and security of our installs. However, you can't go around saying, well, since it's not a law, I don't have to comply with any of this. You can go ahead and do that. But if somebody is to get hurt or worse yet, killed on one of your job sites, UL and ASTM will be the basis for determining liability. Even though it's not a law, that's what you're going to be held to. It's the standard of our industry the standard of how we install automatic gates. So please don't walk away saying, well, you said it's not a law, I don't have to do it. We need to do it. A good example is the National Electric Code. That is not a law, but it is a standard by which that industry follows and looks up to and adheres to. It's the same thing in our industry. Voluntary. If the gate operator that you're using is UL listed, and most are UL listed, not all, but most are UL listed, um, then you need to adhere to the UL 325 standard for the entire installation. For that entire installation to be compliant, you've got to meet both the UL 325 and the F2200 standards. You've got to meet both. There we go. Okay. The nice thing that I've seen come across in the last probably four or five years is that some local areas are certainly requiring compliance with UL325 and F2200. And I am certainly seeing more specifications across my desk where it's written that this job site will comply with both the standards. That certainly creates a lot more even playing field, and you're only gonna see more and more of this as time goes by. Here's a question that we get frequently. Can I work on an older automatic gate that doesn't meet the standard? And the answer is really simple. Yes, if the gate and the operator was installed prior to the inception of F2200, which happened to be in July of 2002. So if you're working on a 1998 installation, technically, however it is, you can work on that. We feel, the industry feels though, that it is a extremely good idea if you're working on one of these older installations to update inform the end user that, hey, look at things have changed a lot since this installation was put in. It's certainly no one can argue that society today is, is uh, more litigious than it was 25 years ago. Always a good idea when you're working on a pre-2002 or a pre-2000 operator installation to point out where the standards are today versus where they were then and see if the end user wants to talk to you about them. Maybe a single family residence might have a little more uh, resistance to changes, but I can tell you the people that I meet, HOAs, gated community, manufacturing plants, what have you, they are very interested in safety and they wanna hear what you have to say. M many of these people don't understand that automatic gates can be dangerous. When you can point that out, 
not only can you make the job site or the installation safer, you can actually put a few dollars in your pocket. Existing gates after July 2002 have to meet the standard in effect at that time which basically means there's, there's seven editions of UL 325. Um, at that time, you have to meet them. So if you're working on a 2010 installation and there are no reversing devices, there are no nothing on this job site, most likely that job site's not in compliance and you and your company need to come to a decision on what you're gonna do in that situation. The big one is here, regardless of the time frame, if you're going to replace the gate operator, the entire installation needs to be brought up to today's standard. Some things we're gonna talk about. So just for example, if you've got a slide gate where the pickets are six inches on center and it was installed in you know, 1992, and it's finally time to replace the gate operator, you've got to bring it up to today's standard, the standards we're going to be talking about. There's no ifs, ands, or buts on that. Other than this fantastic webinar you're sitting on today, where can you find more information about F2200? The easiest one is in your gate operator manual, the RTFM, read the full manual. Most of these manufacturers do an excellent job in their manual explaining UL325 and ASTM F2200 in the very beginning of their manual. It's extremely good information that is easy to read. If you ever had to read the whole UL325 document, you'd never have problems sleeping again. They give you the Reader's Digest version. It helps. And one thing to remember, if there is liability. If there's an injury, they're always going to refer back to the manual of that manufacturer's gate operator. That's what you're going to be held to. So always follow the manufacturer's manual. No exceptions there. There's great resources out there by DASMA.com and ASTM.org. Zach will have links to these afterwards so that you can go to them. Um, as we said before, if you read over the manual, you read over questions, or you have questions still, please send me an email, pick up the phone, call me, call Zach. We, we would want to talk to you about this. We're very happy to. We realize that today we're going to tell you it, it pretty much today's webinar is black and white. And I understand when you go out in the field later today, all, there's all kinds of gray. I get that. We will do our best to go through that. Um, so please, any questions? Hey Tim, I got a comment, um, if I could. The, the ASTM standard, as Tim mentioned, the UL325 standard, you're not going to buy that. It's three inches thick and it's, you, you can't even read it. Um, the ASTM standard is for sale. Uh, it's a copywritten document. It's available at ASTM.org. Uh, I think it's, I don't know, 45, 50 bucks. That one's worth, uh, I think, having on the truck. And there's also some, um, some reference materials through DASMA that, that cover it pretty well. So you can certainly go, uh, go there and, and find the bulk of what you need. But um, most of it is in the manuals these days. Um, wanna, wanna clarify a, distinct, a distinction and Al uh, brought it up on the, uh, the chat line. He makes a really good point. You know, when we talk about it being a voluntary standard, uh, kind of what we're talking about is there's no federal law, you know, saying that uh, you must comply to these standards. But um, as Al mentions here, it, in his region, it's not voluntary. It's actually inspected. The building inspectors um, are looking for this stuff and it is in the building codes, which we will detail to you uh, here shortly. Um, and in certain states, uh, it may be law, Nevada being one of them. In uh, Louisiana, uh, it's being marshaled uh, by the fire departments. So when we say it's voluntary, it's a little bit tongue in cheek in the fact that it's not a federal law, but it very well may be mandatory in your region. Good points, very good points. A little bit of, uh, little, just a little bit of history. F2200, which is designed for gates that are intended to be automated, came into effect, standard came into effect 
on July of 2002. We like to point these dates out there, not because there's a quiz at the end, but you know, we are almost at 18 years. The information that we're gonna give you here is not brand new. This is stuff that has been around for a while. It does evolve, don't get me wrong, it does evolve, but you know, been around since 2002. So um, if someone says, I never heard about this, well, they're, they're not completely paying attention to the industry here. Today, what we're gonna talk about is focus on slide and swing gates. There are certainly other types of gates out there. You've got your vertical lift, your vertical pivots, overhead pivots, there's other gates, there's bifolds. For the most part, we're gonna focus on slide swing and a little bit on vertical pivots. Doesn't mean to diminish the others, but in the essence of time, um, that's what we're gonna focus on because those are certainly the most common gates. The first section here of F2200 covers all types of automated gates. Doesn't matter if it's slide, swing, vertical lift, vertical pivot, whatever gate you're designing, installing that is automated has to meet this section of F2200. We are gonna dive deep into specific slide, specific swing type things. But right now, everything here doesn't matter what type of gate, if it's automated, it's got to adhere to these things here. Basically, fallover protection. One of the things that hurts a lot of people, believe it or not, gates fall over. Maybe they get run into, maybe they run off the track, whatever it may be. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a slide gate, swing gate. F2200 document says that a gate cannot fall over more than 45 degrees from its vertical plane. We can't have gates falling over on people. We'll talk a little bit more about this on each operator or each uh, type. No protrusions. These are, this is a big one, greater than one half of an inch on the leading and trailing vertical gate edges and the bottom edge of the gate. So no protrusions out the sides and the bottom, greater than a half of an inch. If they are gonna be a half an inch or less, they cannot be sharp. So if you're gonna run a picket or something past the bottom of the gate, no more than a half of an inch, it cannot be sharp. It's gotta be rounded over and smooth. Again, it doesn't matter if slide, swing, or whatever type of gate, this is all gates. Even including a vertical pivot. Probably one of the last gates you want you know, a protrusion coming off the bottom of the gate as that thing's coming down. Applies to all gates. They cannot be sharp in any way. Um, the picture in the middle, while I can understand why people might want to do that, maybe prevent cars from pushing on gates and things like that, F2200 says we cannot do that. Somebody could get hurt there. And boy, boy, I don't know how you would defend that in that picture there. Chain brackets can't extend past the gate. They have to be designed so that they're on the inside of the leading and trailing edge of the gate. The swing gate on the bottom, we've got pickets extending. Can't do that. Easy way to fix that, um, either stop the pickets at that bottom horizontal rail or just put a piece of flat stock on the bottom of those. But regardless, no protrusions past the bottom and the leading and trailing edge of the gate. Um, again, now allowable protrusions, of course, we can come off the top of the gate with our decorative, uh, you know, designs or pickets, what have you. That's perfectly fine. Gate locks are okay. Um, most protrusions are allowed the top of the gate. That's the least point of contact with a human. Barbed wire, barbed tape. Again, all automatic gates. Barbed wire has to be six feet or higher. Barbed tape, eight feet or higher. So if you've only got a four foot tall gate per F2200, you're not putting barbed wire or barbed tape on that gate. It's gotta be six and eight feet respectively. Some pictures here, the one on the left, if, if that gate was going to be automated, that barbed tape, is not allowed unless it's eight feet or greater. Picture on the right, 
That's a slide gate, barbed wire. It's six feet off the ground, perfectly compliant. That's what we want there. Mechanical latches. Let's say this was a mechanical gate that's now going to be automated. All mechanical gate latches must be disabled when you decide to automate that gate. Have to be disabled. This one here is a big one. The gate cannot move when it's disconnected from the gate operator. To paraphrase or to try to simplify that, basically it means if you've got a gate on a slope and you disconnect the chain from the operator or you can disconnect the uh, gate, the swing gate operator from the gate and the gate moves, per F2200, that's not allowed. I understand many of us live in areas where it's hilly. You have to make a business decision on what you're gonna do, but this is what the standard does say. Let's get specific now on types of gates. Hey, We're Tim. gonna start with slide gates. The reason we start with slide gates is there are more injuries and deaths that occur in slide gates than do all of the other gates. Doesn't mean that the other gates don't injure people. They certainly do. There's just more injuries and deaths with a slide gate. Therefore, they actually have the stringent set of um, safety measures on them. Hey, Tim, can I pause yes. for a moment? Yes. Great. Um, hey, a couple of questions came in via chat, and uh, one of them came in uh, privately. Um, but the, the question was, do I need to go back and revisit and retrofit to the standard for all my installations that were 2002 and onward? Um, so to, to further paint the picture, you didn't really, uh, didn't realize the standard was in place. And back in 2002, 2003, 2004, you know, it might not have been as visible to you. Um, so you let's just go a little further. You installed a, a, an operator in 2004. Um, you did not uh, heed the ASTM F22 gate construction uh, standard. Should you go back and retrofit those? Uh, to Tim's point, it's a business decision. Um, there are certain aspects of ASTM that I would not, uh, I would not pass up. I mean, they absolutely need to be done. And because it creates a, a, a large risk of entrapment or injury. Uh, but you're going to have to make some business decisions. Technically, all of those installations past 2002 or 2002 and onward should comply to ASTM F2200. Okay. Um, another comment came in, and it's a good one from, from Cynthia that, uh, hey, man, this is tough to manage. You've got fencing contractors, electrical contractors, uh, automatic gate contractors, landscapers. You got all these. Uh, contractors working on this gate, maybe uh, security contractors to make it uh, function properly. And uh, it's hard to manage. One thing I want to point out is that ASTM F2200, and Tim mentioned it earlier, is the gate construction standard for gates intended to be automated. I think they were very intentional the way they wrote that because you could be a, um, a fence company that only builds the gate, doesn't automate it. You could be a, uh, a manufacturer of gates, again, that does not automate the gates, you just provide the gate. Um, those companies need to heed ASTM F2200 standards. They need to build those gates. If they know that that gate's gonna be automated, they've gotta to build to that standard. And so uh, regardless of the fact, if you're just doing the automation, uh, again, the manufacturer of the gate uh, needs to build to these standards. That's a, that's a very good point, Zach. If I'm Tim's Ironworks and all I do is fabricate, I don't automate anything, I don't do it. I work with a bunch of automatic gate companies or maybe I work with fence companies. Um, but if, I, if I'm the fabricator and I know that gate is going to be automated, I will be looked upon in court as liable, as sharing some of the liability. Just because I don't automate it, if I know it's intended to be automated, I hold liability for that. So 
if there's just automatic gate company on here who work with people who fabricates their gates, you need to be having these discussions with them. They're, they're on the hook as well as you. Yep. Okay, so let, let's dive in um, specifically right now to slide gates. Slide gates typically have rollers, whether it's a cantilever gate, a V-track gate, um, they have, if they have exposed rollers and they're less than eight feet, they must be guarded. One thing that I, I like and dislike about F2200 is they worked very hard not to tell you how to build something. They want to let you have the freedom to choose your designs and this and that. So they are saying, if you've got an exposed roller, you've got to cover it if it's less than eight feet. That's very important to know. Many, many fingers and toes have been lost because we did not cover our rollers. Very important to do this. There is a provision, Zach's gonna get into in the UL section, the classes of gate operators. There's four classes of gate operators. Class four allows a lot more, um, maybe how would I say, uh, freedom a little bit more, less scrutiny on their job sites. There's very few class four installations. So don't take a class four with too much liberty. And we'll explain more on that. Here's just some examples of some rollers. And these are examples only. Um, if you're using a V-track gate, your V-track wheels have to be guarded. If you're using guide rollers, got to be guarded. Your, can, your exposed cantilever rollers, if they are less than eight feet, they've got to be guarded. And that includes the bottom ones. And I live in sunny, warm California where I don't know what that white stuff that falls in the wintertime is. I think you guys call it snow. Um, but those bottom rollers, I understand, can be somewhat of a, a bear. ASTM says, got to cover them. And I know there's some good products on the market that help with that. This one here, I want to spend a little bit of time on. I'm, I'm willing to bet many of you, if not all of you, know this part of the standard, but I want to spend time on it because this is where people are getting hurt. A slide gate operator that's automated, the spacing between the pickets cannot exceed a two and a quarter inch sphere to fit through it up to 72 inches or six feet above the gate and the adjacent fence that it slides on. This is a big one, been around for a long, 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 long time. And I am seeing fantastic compliance with this. There was a lot, a lot of people who said, I will never do this early on. And I would bet the vast majority of gates now are being, um, are finding far more compliancy with this part of the standard. All of the provisions in this standard are important. We all have our pets. This one's my pet. Um, and Zach will show in, in UL where people are getting hurt is reaching through the gate. If we can minimize, prevent reach throughs on gates, we are going to minimize um, greatly the injuries that happen. So a two and a quarter inch sphere up to six feet tall, excuse me, two and a quarter inch sphere cannot fit through the gate up to six feet high and the adjacent fence that it slides upon. How you accomplish that is up to you. There's many things you can do. Could you weld more pickets? Yes. Could you put mesh on the gate? Yes. I've had um, many a phone call where people say, you know, so F2200 says I have to mesh the gate. That is not true. There is nothing in F2200 says that you must put screening on the gate. The standard's very, very clear and simple. A two and a quarter inch sphere can't fit through the gate up to six feet. However you want to accomplish that, that's up to you. And I like that part of it. This next slide here shows a picture of a gate that, you know, someone started out doing a good job. The bottom part of the gate, it adheres to that two and a quarter inch facing, but then something went wrong in the gate design. And remember, it's two and a quarter inch, up to six feet above grade. So 
in this situation, specifically talking about screening, this gate in this picture is not compliant. And it leads you to a question, which certainly we'll get to probably more at the end. What happens if you're just a service tech and you show up on this job because you never installed it, you've never been here before, they called you out because they said the gate isn't working. Your company has to make a business decision what they would do with this automatic gate on here on how they would handle that. Okay, some more examples here of the two and a quarter inch. The gate on the left, it's a nice open design. Wind certainly is never gonna catch that gate, but it's not in compliancy. The spacing there is far too great. That is a situation just asking for an injury. That's just nowhere near can that be acceptable by today's standards. The one on the right, cantilever gate, that back frame, that's part of the gate. And it also must adhere to the two and a quarter, the entire gate and the entire fence that it slides upon. Two and a quarter inch. I'm sorry to really be droning that home. This is the one that I'm really passionate about. This is the one that I see people getting hurt in too often. No, and I think it's good that you are, Tim, right? This is um, one thing we can do to prevent reach through. Uh, we're going to point out some other things that we can do, but it's reaching through that gate to you know, hit a button or whatever, or some, you know, kids riding the gate or whatnot, but it's super important that we screen the gate. And, um, you know, the, the industry recognized that this was an important one. This is, this is where we had some pretty high profile cases of folks reaching through the gate. And uh, that's where they come up with a two and a quarter. Now, can a kid reach through two and a quarter? They absolutely can. And that's why the rest of the standard, including UL325 is so important. Absolutely. I mean, late last year, a young man lost his life in a brand new gate installation that was 100% preventable. 100%. Not trying to throw anybody under the bus or anything like that, but this young man is now not on this planet anymore because of someone didn't adhere to the F2200. So this is a big one to me. Okay, let's talk about the gaps, if you will. And this is where UL and ASTM have a little bit of a slight difference. So I'm going to present the F2200 side. Zach will get to the UL side. Basically, what it says is that if the gate frame comes in contact with a stationary object that is greater than two and a quarter inches, it's considered an obstruction, and it's got to be um, taken care of. We look at the, the drawing here basically have a support post in the gate if the gap between that gate and that support post is greater than two and a quarter inches that cavity has to be filled um, if it's less than two and a quarter inches per f2200 you're compliant um, if there's a post like in the second part of that uh, drawing that is 16 inches or greater from the gate that is not an entrapment and you're okay there, greater than 16. You'll find in today's, uh, well, in UL and F2200, there's a lot of the same numbers. There's a lot of two and a quarter. There's a lot of 16s, things like that. They've really tried to keep the vast numbers down and try to have a standard for them all. Where we are seeing a lot of the injuries, not all, but a lot of the injuries in a slide gate is in what we call the draw-in post. Someone gets in between that supporting post and the gate, whether it's an arm or their whole body, and they're drawn in to there. We're trying to find ways to protect that. There's many ways to do it. We're gonna talk about it a little bit here, but a lot in UL. But this is the, the I don't wanna say it's the number one, but many, many, many injuries and deaths occur at the drawing post. And we need to take note of that. I want to make a, a point here. You know, you've got UL325 as one standard. You got ASTM as a separate standard. Uh, as Tim has mentioned, they're, they're meant to work in harmony, but they are two separate standards. We've got to meet ASTM F2200, and we've got to meet UL325. And uh, this is a good example where um, ASTM says, hey, you got to fill that gap to less than two and a quarter between that gate and the fixed stationary post. Okay, it doesn't say 
but if you put an edge there, you can leave that gap open. And there's been some clarification over the last couple of years since uh, really 2018 that um, made it very clear that that's the case. So that, that's a great point, Zach. If there's an entrapment, fix it. You know, um, fix it. And really, the purpose here is we're trying to show you where the vast majority of the injuries are occurring. Um, that draw on post is just, it's an enemy to us uh, as far as injuries. There are a lot of things we can do to fix it, but you know, fill the gap and then we'll find that um, we're really gonna stress putting an edge on that post as well. Maybe it's redundant. I'll take redundancy over injuries any day. Example of a picture here, just, you know, if the spacing between these posts is two and a quarter inch or less, that's acceptable, that's compliancy by F2200. If they're greater than two and a quarter inches, some kind of filler needs to go in there to minimize that. Does F2200 say what you have to do? Absolutely, they do not. They say you gotta fill it. I've seen many creative things. Um, this is a job site here where we're gonna refer to several times. Um, you know, someone got some good money selling edges on this. They did a great job. Um, they did an excellent job of putting edges, but however, that gate post there is far greater than two and a quarter inches per F2200, even with the edges, which we want. We want those edges, which we'll talk about. That gap is not compliant and it's gotta be filled to less than two and a quarter inches. Somebody could certainly get hurt in there. Positive stops. A lot of people use them. Some people don't. Um, a quick war story years ago I was on a tech call with someone helping them set up a brand new machine, slide gate. Um, they got the radio working. I don't know. All of a sudden, I heard the technician scream. Phone went dead. I tried to call back. Couldn't do anything. He wouldn't answer. Call his office. Long story short, he didn't have the limit set yet. There was no positive stops. This gate went right off the track and fell on him, crushed him, and broke his back. This is the installer. Imagine if this was, you know, John Q. Public. Positive stops are required. It's not an option. Cannot let that gate fall down. It cannot over travel. It's got to meet that positive stop. They don't tell you specifically how to do it. You design your gate so that it's compliant, so the gate can't over travel. Also have to make sure that you don't put thing protrusions out into the opening. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. There's a gate catch or a gate retainer here that they're using for a stop, which is fine, but it can't protrude into the lane opening unless it's more than eight feet. That gate, if they're gonna use that, that gate would need to slide past that post, that receiver post, which I have a slide come up in a moment, has to be behind. Happens to be this slide. If you're gonna use receiver guides, where the gate slides into something so it's secure, if it's less than eight feet above grade, it cannot protrude into the lane opening. It has to be recessed behind that post. If it's out in the lane opening in less than eight feet, F2200 says, you know, that that is something that could certainly harm someone and it's gotta be put behind the fence line or behind that post. Some examples here, that comes up, of some receiver posts. A Little bit hard to see. The one on the left, the chain link there, that is just not acceptable. That's, you know, that's an accident just that's going to happen. And that's installed just a couple of feet off the ground. If that gate was to push somebody into that, that would seriously harm somebody. Um, the middle picture, they've got a receiver post, but it's extended into the lane opening. They can't do that. It has to be mounted behind the gate so that it's not protruding into the lane eight feet or less. If you have a biparting or a dual gate system and you want to have a receiver guide on there so that they, these gates interlock, that receiver has to be nine square inches. 
um, on each leading edge for that to be F2200 compliant. I'm not sure how many of these happen in the, in the real world, but this is the number that they came up with. If you're gonna have a receiver guide or a catch on a dual panel gate, biparting gate, and it's less than eight feet off the ground, nine square inches is the magic number there. I think this applies to locks as well, right, Tim? Yep. If you've got a mag lock or something like that, that's okay, but you should have a nice flat surface. Yes. That's what they're trying to do is get the flat surface. That's the moral behind it. Fallover protection. However you design your slide gate, it's up to you, but the gate cannot fall over. If it's run into this or that, whatever, it cannot fall over more than 45 degrees from the vertical plane. We cannot have gates falling over. F2200 doesn't specifically say how you do that. They're gonna leave that design up to you. The gate can't fall over, big one. That happens, I got a picture here. Um, I believe this was in the UK. This gate fell over and killed somebody. Can't have gates falling over. Just it's, can't. Pro it's probably a combination, sorry to interrupt, but uh, probably a combination of both no positive stops and or no fallover protection. There's probably right. fallover protection there, but it ran past its stops. It ran past it, you're exactly right. That's why both of them are required to be in compliance with F2200. There's just, there's really no good excuse for this. We have to do this. Um, today's society especially, I mean, we don't want this press in our industry. We don't want this. We, you know, we don't, we don't want these things happening then all of a sudden the outside society gets into, involved in our industry and starts telling us how to put in our automatic gates. That we can prevent these things Life is just going to continue to be good, and we can do it. We can't wrap every person in bubble wrap. If somebody wants to get hurt in anything, they can accomplish that. Our job is to protect the obvious. Our job is to do the things that we can do, and that's the purpose of F2200 and UL325. Okay, we're going to move on to swing gates. Swing gates are a lot simpler than sliders. doesn't mean that people don't get hurt. They certainly do, but just by the nature of how they work, they're not as hazardous as sliders. Doesn't mean they're free of injuries, but they are certainly a little bit safer. There are some things we gotta do. For example, this is a big one here. I see swing gates on gated communities or private residences where they build a, a beautiful stone column, brick column, what have you. Um, maybe it's a two foot, three foot, four foot column and we hang the gate right in the center of it. That's what I'd want on my house. Think it looks awesome. The problem with that is when that gate opens up against that column, you've created an entrapment or a pinch point. F2200 states that if you have more than four inches from the center of the gate hinge to the back of that column, that's an entrapment. You have a couple choices here. You can do, you can protect that column with an edge, a photo beam, whatever you wanna design. And UL will cover that a little bit more. What F2200 says, if you decide to put a gate and there's more than four inches between the back of that column and the center of the hinge, that is an entrapment that must be protected. Going forward in our gate design, uh, ahead of things, if we can move that gate to the back of the column, they can still have their four foot column. We just move it to the back. If we eliminate that four inches, we've eliminated an entrapment. They still get the look and everything they want. This is where we need to work with, where, Zach, you had that question earlier, was there's a lot of people here. Maybe there's a, a mason involved, maybe there's a landscape architect. We need to work with these people we can get that gate mounted to the back. We have just eliminated an entrapment. Here's an example we're talking about. Brick column, they hung it in the center, which is perfectly allowed. 
I'm not saying that you cannot hang a gate in the center of a big cone. F2200 says if it's more than four inches, you've got an entrapment and you've got to protect it. This gate's already hung. We've got to do something, possibly put an edge on the column on the inside where it swings. If we could get to this job site before it was built, we moved the gate to the back of that column, we have no entrapment. If the swing gate, when it's open, comes in contact with a fixed object 16 inches or less, F2200 says we have an entrapment zone. 16 inches or less, a fixed object. What is a fixed object? That's, that's subject to interpretation, but it's there. That gate comes within it. It's got to be protected. We typically will shoot a photo beam back there to the whole travel of that gate, that eliminates that entrapment. If we can, on the design stage, make that gap bigger than 16 inches, we no longer have an entrapment zone. Here's a gate that, you know, happens a lot. The gate opens up, right? Certainly a lot less than 16 inches. Again, we can do this. This is not, not, not allowed. It's perfectly allowed. However, we have to protect that entrapment zone if it's less than 16 inches. A photo beam is very common. It's not the only thing, but it's probably the most common thing that does that. In today's world, which Zach's gonna cover in UL, that photo beam has to be monitored. Monitored means that if it's not there, if it's not working, the gate's not gonna be working. The old days, we didn't have monitoring. However, this was still an entrapment and was supposed to be protected. 16 inches or less. I love this slide. Um, get a lot of object objections to it. It's not just slide gates that can't fall over. Swing gates can't fall over either. Swing gate is not allowed to fall over more than 45 degrees. F2200 doesn't say how to accomplish that. They want to leave that up to you. These are just some methods that we've encountered, encountered out there whether it's a cable, a chain that's welded, what have you. F2200 is very clear on here, gate cannot fall over. This is just some methods here. Probably the nicest thing about swing gates is, swing gates are gonna be automated, is there are no restrictions whatsoever on reach through or picket spacing. Your gate construction now is completely up to you and your customer, whatever you want to do. You want to have 20 inch openings, have 20 inch openings. It doesn't matter. There are no reach through or picket space requirements on swing gates. Class four, Zach will talk a little bit more. It's a lot more lax. We get a little bit more freedom with class four installations, but there's very few class fours. The majority of our installations out there are class one, two, and three. Here's some photos of just some job sites out there of swing gates. Um, if you notice the upper portions of those gates, the picket spacing is more than two and a quarter. Um, yeah, that's perfectly allowed. It's allowed all the way to the bottom of the gate. There's no restrictions on picket spacing again on your swing gates. Again, uh, you cannot have protrusions, things like that. This is specifically talking about the reach through on a swing gate. Spend just a few moments talking about vertical pivot gates. These certainly have a, uh, a good gates, sell a lot of them. They definitely have the ability to hurt somebody if they are not in compliance with F2200. Number one, it's very similar requirements, not exactly the same, but it's very similar to slide gates. The portion of the gate that goes up or swings up, if you will, past a fixed object has to be designed so the two and a quarter inch sphere cannot pass through that area all the way up to six feet, just like a slide gate. So this includes the gate and the gate panel that that uh, gate is swinging up in the air against. And here's a picture of it. 
this installer chose to put screening on the gate, perfectly compliant, did a great job, but he didn't put it on the fence panel next to it. So he only did 50% of the job. We need that entire fence panel that that gate is going up against to also adhere to the two and a quarter inch spacing up to six feet. Very important there. There's a shearing action there that can seriously, seriously hurt somebody. I, I get the question, why would someone reach through the gate? I don't know, people reach through gates. It's not for us to decide why they do it, it's for us to make sure they don't do it. And Tim, you mentioned shearing action. If you can be you know, rest assured that if there's, regardless if it's a, you know, a slider or a vertical pivot or a horizontal uh, lift that if there's shearing action, that two and a quarter requirements probably going to exist. Absolutely, absolutely. So another example of a vertical pivot here in this particular case, the gate nor the fence panel adheres to the two and a quarter inch. That's just, you know, that's an accident waiting to happen. Even if there's no access device, there's just absolutely zero reason for someone to reach through the gate. Stuff happens, it just happens. Um, one, I don't want any injuries. I know injuries are going to happen. I don't want any, but I just don't know how you could defend this. If you installed this, what your defense would be. It's very clear that if you installed this, you didn't adhere to F2200. It'd be a tough day in court. And someone's hurt. That's far more important. Yeah, and if you're limiting liabilities, again, you want to be thorough. And let's say somebody gets hurt um, as that gate's going down. Did your screening have anything to do with that? No. But as you're sitting there in court and they're picking you apart, why didn't you do this or that? Those type of things come up and they come into play. Exactly. You are 100% true. That is, that is not an exaggeration. They are looking for someone to blame. And if... <laughs> If you didn't adhere, even though that part of it didn't have anything to do with it, it certainly could come into play. They'll bring it up, trust me. They will bring it up. Um, just like swing gates, just like slide gates, just like all gates, a vertical pivot cannot have protrusions coming off the bottom or the trailing edges. Probably extremely important here. This thing is coming down on top of somebody. We do not want protrusions coming down and hitting them. Just don't want that. Um, there, like I said early on, there's lots of different types of gates, um, lots of different types of gates. For today's standard or today's webinar, we wanted to talk about, you know, the three biggies, really the two biggies, slide and swing, certainly vertical boot. That's not meant to minimize the others. It's in the essence of time. If you have questions on those, can always refer to the manual, which is a great idea. You can always pick up the phone, send us an email. Be happy to talk to you about them. Happy. With that, that ends the portion of F2200. It was pretty fast going through that. Um, but uh, that definitely covered the main points of F2200. Happy to answer any questions or we jump off into the next part. I think we will move into UL325. I'm going to stop the sharing. I'm just going to uh, share over the top of you. No okay. Problem. Perfect. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, you got me? Gotcha. <laughs> All right, great job, Tim. Uh, okay, we're going to jump from ASTM F2200 to UL325. And to reiterate the, the distinction, again, ASTM F2200 has to do with the gate construction, how you build the gate, okay? Now we're gonna talk about the UL requirements to make that gate safe, okay? And how the gate operator manufacturers have to comply with these standards. Okay. Okay, so what's, what is uh, Underwriters Laboratories? Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that uh, tests equipment. Um, as you can imagine, 
you know, I like to go back to as electricity was starting to prevail throughout the country, people were building products, lights and things of that nature, electrical devices. And uh, it was pretty quick to realize that uh, from a safety standard, uh, we need uh, an organization that is testing these devices to certain standards. Uh, so uh, Underwriters Laboratories is, is kind of the marquee company. It's a nonprofit company that helps create standards, uh, working in conjunction with the industry, like uh, the fencing industry and gate industry. There was an ad hoc committee made up of industry members that helped build the UL325 standards. And that was very intentional. We, as an industry, wanted to make sure that the government didn't come in and say, okay, you guys haven't policed yourselves, we're gonna write the standard for you. And that could have been much more punitive. If you look at the two and a quarter numbers, like where'd that come from? Um, and I could tell you that came from folks on that committee, chain link fence, right? All those chain link fence weavers, they didn't wanna have to retool. Um, and so it was tied somewhat to that. But just as an example, of an ad hoc committee helping to build a standard in conjunction with UL. Um, and uh, and uh, there are other organizations that can test to the standard, but um, it's, a, it's a technically a UL standard that they're testing to. They're not a government agency, as, as, as many would think, but uh, they do work uh, closely with the CPSC. Uh, as injury numbers increase, they might get called in to uh, help support that industry to create new standards. Um, again, similar to uh, ASTM F2200, there's no federal law or federal mandate. Um, as Al had mentioned earlier, it's absolutely uh, could be required in your region or state. Again, Nevada is the one uh, that jumped on board first, uh, making UL325 uh, law in that state. And it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds over time, uh, what states or organizations pick up the torch and make sure that compliance is happening. Okay. Again, it's, it's voluntary for manufacturers to, to submit for testing. And there are a lot of products out there, specifically on the internet, uh, that are not tested to UL325 standards. They may have a UL I don't know, 991 electrical uh, type certification, but it may not be tested to UL325. So that's key that you look out for that. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, UL may create the standard, but there are other testing labs that can test the operators to that UL standard. So it's perfectly acceptable to have a, uh, you know, an ETL tested operator uh, that's tested to UL325, and you will see it on the label. Okay. And, you know, we'd like to clarify, you hear things like, oh, it's UL approved or UL certified. They'd like to make a clear distinction that, hey, UL doesn't recommend products. They simply test to particular standards, okay? And it's really as professionals, and you all are, that's why you're on this call, that um, we recognize that the, that that liability or that responsibility is on us uh, to make sure that that operator is tested and listed and that we're following UL and ASTM throughout the whole installation. Okay. Um, Tim mentioned some dates. And uh, again, I agree. I think he, he, sa he says it well. We don't throw these dates out there so that you can memorize them, but more to call out the fact that these standards have been in place for quite some time now. Specifically, I want to call out fourth edition in March of 2000. The majority of what we're talking about today was in place well, 20 years ago, right? So, um, you know, these aren't new. Most of the stuff that we're talking about today is not new. It's been in place for quite some time. We have required, it has required some iteration. Uh, and that's where you saw uh, sixth edition being uh, quite uh, the earth shaker for the industry. That's when we started requiring monitor devices. Why did we require monitor devices? Well, let's face the facts. We weren't doing what we needed to do from an industry perspective 
uh, in following the fourth edition, fifth edition um, standards. So we had to raise the bar a little bit and require monitored devices. Seventh edition um, further defined how many devices we need for different types of situations and also further defined what an entrapment zone is. And we'll get into that. And again, you know, why are we following this? It's in the code. You, you, you might say, hey, it's, it's in all these codes, but the inspectors don't know anything about it. You're absolutely right. It does take time to filter into local um, jurisdictions and for them to adopt it. And furthermore, um, you know, they need to be trained on, you know, what to look for. And unfortunately, that's been a slow process. Um, OSHA can require UL compliance in many cases, so there's a good reason to comply. As we mentioned earlier, some states are requiring either uh, not only that you comply to UL and ASTM, in some states they're requiring licensing or certification, rather. So maybe a CAGSD or CAGOI. Why should you do it? Limit your liabilities. And, and, and again, there are things in here that you should absolutely not look past, regardless of a, a specifier or architect or um, artist that wants to build the gate uh, to a certain uh, look. Um, and even security in some cases, uh, you really want to limit your liabilities by following the standard. And you know, at the end of the day, you wanna put your head down as a business owner or even an installer. You wanna put your head down at night and sleep well. Let's just do the right thing to protect people and mainly kids, right? It's not, it's usually, I should say, I shouldn't even say that because there's been plenty of high profile adults getting hurt in this, but uh, kids get hurt as well. So we gotta protect the innocent. And I think, Tim, you might have brought, you know, brought up this analogy of the National Electrical Code. National Electrical Code is not, isn't a federal law either, right? Um, so uh, I think it's a good analogy. We would dare not follow those codes. Uh, we shouldn't uh, look past these codes either. Okay. As a new install, as a new installer, okay. The compliancy, everything you need to know about UL, as we mentioned earlier, is in the manual, okay? Again, you don't need to purchase a UL 325 book. Uh, you should get, gather everything you need from that manual, and if you follow that manual to the T, uh, you're, in, uh, you're in a good place, okay? RTFM, okay? And you know, failure, failure to comply to those uh, standards within the manual are gonna be pretty obvious in a court of law. I'm sorry, one more distinction. The other thing you can draw from that manual is the type of entrapment device you use and actual down, actually down to the model number. Uh, example, I got a slide smart CNX. In that manual, it's going to tell you you can use these very specific photo eyes, very specific edges, wireless devices, so on and so forth. To be fully compliant with UL, you can only use the safety devices that are listed in the manual. Hey, Zach, if I can, so what we're saying there is the manufacturer says I've got to use these photo beams. And my favorite photo beam that I like, I know it will work on the, this machine in a monitored situation, but it's not in the manual. Can I substitute? And the answer is technically no, you can't. That's a good point. It'll work, um, but technically no. If you ended up in court, that's one of those things they'd pick apart. Well said. Old installations. Again, similar to ASTM, it follows the vintage of the operator, okay? Um, now, I don't have to, we, we showed you in 2016 that devices uh, required monitored entrapment devices. The gate operators required monitor entrapment. That doesn't mean that I got to go back to that 2014 install and install monitored devices. It's based on the vintage of the machine. Okay. If you service a site, 
it might be a good idea to see if it can be brought into compliance, right? Um, it's going to be pretty common for you. Uh, you know, it's estimated that well under 10% of the installations out there actually comply to UL and ASTM. You should make a business decision on bringing that site up to compliance. Um, and if the end user doesn't want to bring it up to standards, again, you're going to make a business decision whether you service it or not. And I would recommend that you continue, if you do decide to service it, that you continue to try to educate them and, and get them to up, upgrade to the current standards. Okay. And yeah, just a, just a call out. It's not within the, you know, UL underwriters laboratories policing power um, to make sure that you're installing this correctly. Okay. It's just not, uh, it's not what they do. We hit ASTM. Okay. Some, some best practices as the industry has put forth, develop a checklist for that customer to sign off. You know, things like, hey, we've adjusted the uh, inherent sensor. We've showed you where those sensors are. We've put up a warning sign. You sign off that, yes, there's a warning sign. Yes, we've seen that you've adjusted the sensor. We've trained you on how the gate works, okay? So develop that checklist and sign off for them. Uh, perform that final review. You want to make sure that you go through a full review with your client on how the gate system works and where the safety devices are and why they, why they are there. Okay. And really good idea that you include preventative maintenance, right? You've installed this operator from uh, a new install. It's, it's important that it gets maintained. As we all know, hardware starts to wear out. Um, it could need to be adjusted. Uh, the inherent sensor may need to be adjusted. Uh, something down the road might've got knocked out of whack. And so if you can put a PM in place to, to make sure that all the safety precautions are being taken over time, um, you're gonna be ahead of the game. Hey Zach. Um... Yeah. Real quick, we have a, a good question from, from Roy. He says, if you were the last person to touch this installation, and even though you or your company had nothing to do with the original installation, um, what's your liability in the event of an accident? Yeah, you've, you've got some liability there. And I'll, and I'll kind of go back to um, a mock trial that we do at some of the trade shows to kind of help depict how some of the legal uh, aspects of this come into play. And that's kind of one of the exact situations that, that we talk about in that mock trial. Um, you didn't do the original install, you rolled up, it doesn't meet compliance, um, you work on it anyway, you're gonna have some level of liability if somebody gets hurt down the road. And, uh, and that's why it's such an important business decision of whether you're gonna work on that gate or not that's not compliance. I think if there's something glaring, for example, a slide gate that the picket spacing is greater than two and a quarter inches and there's a keypad right on the other side, that's, that's a gate I wouldn't even touch. Yeah, run. Yeah. You know, certainly, you know, try to educate the, the end user and, and see if you can get that thing up to compliance. Um, you know, and, and one, one statement that I think the industry would all agree upon is an operator that's still out there and running, you know, prior to 2000 that didn't, weren't, wasn't UL 325 fourth edition, um, that should be replaced. No ifs, ands, or buts. They, there were some absolute meat grinders out there. They didn't even have inherent sensors. The manufacturers weren't required to put them in. There weren't inputs for additional safeties. Um, so I'd say, you know, there's a line there you can draw for sure. Um, and to Tim's point, there's probably some other lines that you should draw as well. All right. So what if a, a customer says, hey, look, I don't want any of that additional entrapment devices. I don't like the way they look. Um, I don't want to pay the extra money. 
Um, it's really not an option to say, okay, we're gonna bypass or decline to install those devices. Can you bypass safety devices in a new operator and make them work? In some cases you can, uh, but that's a pretty clear violation, all right? What if they're willing to sign a waiver? They're of no practical use. In fact, um, they may even be an admission of guilt. Imagine this, you're, you're putting a waiver together for an end user that says, I don't want any safety devices, okay? You know that they're required and that they're important. Um, and you know, I think the other call out is, the person signing the waiver probably isn't the person getting hurt right? The eight-year-old kid didn't sign the waiver, okay? So, um, again, they're of no practical use, and in fact, they're a bad idea. Okay, we talked a little bit in, in ASTM. Tim had brought up class fours, um, but there are four different classes of operators. I'm going to break this down really quickly. Class one is your, you know, one to four single-family homes, residential, Class two is a commercial uh, type installation or general access installation that services the general public. Those are the key words, okay? That services the general public, um, then it's a class two, okay? Then we jump into a class three, and that would be your commercial industrial site that does not service the general public, that is, you know, a, a manufacturing facility and everybody that uses the gate is trained on how to use the gate. Um, once you jump from a two to a three, some of the UL requirements get a little bit more relaxed. For instance, a slide gate can run more than one foot per second. It could do maybe, you know, one and a half, two foot or more uh, feet per second would be an example of that. Okay. And I would, uh, you know, head your bet. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're putting in an operator that's rated for the application. And if you're not sure if it's a, a three, then I would um, utilize the recommendations under a class two. Okay. And a class four is a um, restricted access, right? Like a, a jail or uh, possibly an airport. Okay, and there's some very specific criteria here um, that there's supervision by security personnel. Um, and in those cases, uh, the AHJ authority having jurisdiction may say, hey, I'm not gonna, you're not putting photo beams or edges on my prison gate, <laughs> okay? And at that point, it would be okay uh, not to put those safety devices on. Again, I would be very cautious to label a gate a class four. In most cases that are brought to me, they ask me if this is a class four. In my opinion, usually it's not, okay. Okay, entrapment zones. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a Big, uh, a big step that, that came in 2018 when they further defined what an entrapment zone is. And this, I'm, I'm not into reading slides to you, but I'm gonna read this one verbatim. A slide gate entrapment zone is locations between a moving gate or counter opposing edge or surface where entrapment is possible up to six feet above grade. Such locations occur if during any point in travel the gap between a moving gate and fixed counter opposing edge or surfaces is less than 16 inches, okay? So if that slide gate slides within a fixed counter opposing edge or surface within 16 inches, that's an entrapment zone. It needs to be protected. Furthermore, swing gate, very similar, right? Locations between a moving gate or exposed operator components uh, and a counter opposing edge or surface where entrapment is possible up to six feet above grade. Okay, so I think they called out the operator components as well, and we'll show you some, some pictures of how the components can come into play. Okay. I'm gonna run through the different safety devices. Uh, you know, if you're taking a test, you'd wanna memorize this, CAGOI, CAGSD, um, but I just wanna call out the different types of safety devices, and A is that inherent sensor, that uh, current sensoring device, or whatever the inherent sensor is that that manufacturer calls out. It's built into the operator, OK? 
okay? V1 is a non-contact sensor, kind of like a photo beam. So I don't have to make contact with anything uh, for the device to work. A B2 is a contact sensor, like an edge, like a contact edge, right? A C is a clutch, um, adjustable clutch or pressure relief device, okay? Um, this is only applies to swing and barrier gate operators, okay? And a D is um, constant pressure. It means I'm holding the button down, uh, an alarm's going off as the gate's closing. When I, if I let off the button, the gate stops. Um, and uh, same for the open, I'm holding the button open, holding the button to, uh, to run open, alarm's going off. I let, the, let go of the button uh, and it stops. We'll get into the, uh, a little bit deeper here. Okay. And this calls out the class, or sorry, this type C device is only for swing and vertical barriers. The clutch, um, one thing I wanna call out on the clutch is a lot of devices have a clutch, okay? And you're gonna see here what, where it says, the standard says, I've got to have two independent means of entrapment per direction to travel. Um, just because the operator has a clutch doesn't mean it's a safety device. Uh, that would need to be called out in the manual as a safety device, okay? So in many cases, those are just sacrificial links, if you will, to protect the hardware, uh, and they're not there for entrapment protection. Okay, the type A, as we mentioned, is that inherent sensor. Okay, and it's adjustable based on the kind of size and weight and, uh, of the gate. Okay, that manufacturer will call that out. The inherent sensor is not adjusted from the factory. It may be adjusted from the factory, and it may, it may seem to work well in the field as you initially install it, but Again, over time, uh, that's gonna need adjustment, but every new install should be adjusted. And every time you service that gate, the inherent sensor should be ad adjusted and documented, okay? Every time you visit. B1, again, this is your photo beam, our non-contact sensor. And it's the installer's responsibility to determine where I've got an entrapment zone and where to place that device, okay? I believe you'll see uh, in the standard here, I think we've got a slide on it, on where to place that B1 device, okay? And they're pretty, pretty prescriptive about it. Yeah, I got a slide coming up on it. What B1 device is compatible with your operator? If this was a live crowd, I'd be asking you this question. And I think you'd know the answer. The answer is in the manual. That's how I'll know if that device is compliant with my operator. Okay. B1's recommended installation is within five inches of that gate. Okay. I think you will, uh, you'll see that in some manuals that it's within five inches of the gate and with between 21 and 27 inches above grade. Okay, that's a kind of a, a recommendation. Not sure it's in the standard per se, but it's uh, certainly in the study guides. Okay, so I, I think though to call out the five inches is pretty critical. If the photo beam's too far away from that slide or swing gate, it's not doing us uh, much good. Okay, B2, that's a contact sensor. Okay. It's our responsibility to determine where those are required, and we're going to show you some examples of where you need to place your, your B2 contact sensors. And again, refer to the manual for a, a list to be compliant. Okay. okay, where do they belong? Here's a typical slide gate scenario. Top view. Uh, we call out the draw-in post. If you leave this session not knowing what a draw-in post, Tim and I have failed. Yes. Okay. And it is probably the area that is the highest risk of entrapment or death. 
okay? People get sucked into this area um, and uh, it doesn't end well. So the draw-in post uh, is super critical. And really, you know, today, uh, there's some new safety devices that I think are gonna enter the market, but today the best way to protect that is with an edge. And the best way to design this system is to hardwire that edge into the gate operator. Okay, so as you're designing systems, try to incorporate the conduit run if need be to accommodate a hardwired contact edge on every drawing post. Don't leave a site, don't leave an installation without an edge on the drawing post. That's kind of what I'm saying, being pretty blunt about it, right? And you'll see a lot of operator manufacturers are now including an edge with every slide gate operator. Uh, they want you to put that on the drawing post. I'll tell you right now, they do. Okay. Uh, Zach, and, one, of, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons to put an edge there, um, of course, is, you know, for that drawing post. But you mentioned the key thing there called hardwired. And I couldn't agree more with hardwiring that edge. And the reason is, is we've all experienced problems with wireless devices. What happens if that gate operator, if this is a wireless edge and the gate operator for whatever reason can't see it, well, the gate's not gonna open because it's a monitored device. When you hardwire it, you're going directly to the control board and you're eliminating any outside interference of happening. But two, guess what you don't have, at least on this one, you don't have batteries. You don't have a callback. Yeah, good call out. Absolutely. Just jump on some of those Facebook uh, groups and, and see if you see <laughs> posts about wireless devices. <laughs> All right, so typical scenario, if you were to protect this whole scenario, knowing what a, the definition of an entrapment zone is on a slide gate, you would have this draw in post connect. Can you see my mouse, Tim? Yeah. Draw in post, you might have one on the leading edge trailing edge, and you might have one on both sides of the operator. Um, kind of a controversial topic, right? Is the operator an entrapment zone? Eh, based on the definition, um, you know, I'll let you guys make that determination, but I think it may be. Okay. Clutch, this is the, the, the section out of the study guide talking about clutches. Again, clutches are only applicable on swing gates and barrier arms, okay? And it should be called out in the manual. Type D, constant pressure. I think this is worth spending a little bit of time on. Um, again, constant pressure, so, so you think about, um, and we'll get into how many, again, how many devices you need, but um, you've got the inherent sensor. So that works both opening and closing. Technically, if I'm in line of sight of the gate, I could put a button and not add any additional safeties. I'm looking at the gate, holding the button as it's opening, holding the button as it's closing. It must be line of sight and it must be permanently fixed. Okay, those buttons must be. Okay. Not all operators have this functionality, by the way. So you would want to make sure that the operator that you're installing, if you're planning on using constant pressure, um, that the operator you're installing uh, has the ability uh, to do constant pressure. I'm getting called out here. I, actually, I appreciate the call out. <laughs> I got called out on, hey, what kind of a statement is that uh, not making a judgment on whether the gate operator is an entrapment zone or not? Um, I'm not the authority. I didn't write the standard. Uh, some of this is open to interpretation. Um, my interpretation is that it is. So I will, uh, <laughs> I'll go on record saying I think the gate operator is an entrapment zone. Uh, the the, the the gate slides within 16 inches of a fixed counter opposing edge. It's an entrapment zone. So the, the, the simple thing on that, Zach, is like when I said is we try on this webinar to make this black and white, but we know when we get out in the real world, there's a tremendous amount of gray. And that's why we make statements like that. 
if you read the definition, I think it's very clear the gate operator is an obstruction. But then you look at the data and you try to find where are the injuries. I'm not saying no one's ever been hurt at the gate operator, but that's not the focus of our injuries. And that's why we make statements like that. Yep. Yeah, and, and by the way, if, if you don't like the standards, the way they're written, uh, anybody can write a proposal to the ULSTP committee for a change. Anybody can do that. And I'd encourage you to do so. Um, and if, if somebody wants uh, some information on how they could go about that, uh, I'd help guide the way for them. Um, what operators, Colin, you asked what operators uh, include an edge that attaches to the housing? I can't think of any, but um, some of like a little two foot edge or whatnot. We certainly sell them. We sell two foot edges all the time. Uh, they do they do provide you know photo beams, but again, what an operator manufacturer is going to provide it, it is safety devices to maybe meet the minimum standard. It's not they're not going to provide every safety device you need because they don't know the parameters of a particular installation. Right? You've got to determine. Hey, I've got more than two entrapment zones here. I need to provide additional safeties. It could be a challenge mounting an edge on a gate operator housing, um, especially if it's a one piece housing, because you're going to have to remove that housing to service the gate at times. It can. Yep. Good call out. Thanks for holding me accountable. Okay, recent updates. Uh, recent updates are in January 2016, the requirements for monitor devices. I think we've kind of beat that up a little bit. But what maybe wasn't clear in 2016 is how many devices do I need to meet the minimum standard? And in 2018, they clarified that. They, they, they came out carte blanche and said, for slide gates, we're gonna require two independent forms of entrapment in each direction, okay? And we'll kind of further detail this, but the gate's going closed, I've got my inherent, I need at least one additional, okay? The slide gate's going open, I've got my inherent, I need at least one additional, either a B1 or a B2, right? Okay, that's to meet the minimum standard. And as designers and installers, you've got to identify any additional entrapment zones and protect those entrapment zones with monitor devices, by the way. Once you've put your two monitor devices in, does not mean that I can now use non-monitored entrapment devices. If it's being used for entrapment, it must be monitored. Swing gates, basically says the same thing, right? Two in the open, two in the closed, with one caveat. Um, they've allowed for the fact that if the gate opens up into nothing, but maybe open closes against a uh, latch post, you've got to protect that latch post with two independent means, but on the open, uh, you wouldn't need an additional form of entrapment, okay? Or vice versa, potentially, if the gate opens up into uh, an entrapment zone, you'd have to protect that. If it closed against nothing, if you will, just kind of open air, uh, you wouldn't have to protect the close. Again, some operators will give you that flexibility, some won't. Some are gonna absolutely require uh, two in the closed and you, it's optional to put one in the open. You determine whether there's an entrapment zone there. Um, and some are going to um, require two in the closed and two in the open, carte blanche. Okay, so it just depends on the manufacturer. Zach, you made a good point. If, if you are going to use a device, an external device, a B1 or a B2, for entrapment protection, it must be monitored. If you have covered all of your entrapment zones, let's say you have what you consider three entrapment zones and you have used three monitor devices, maybe two edges and a photo beam, whatever you've decided to do. Then you decide, and you've covered them all, and then you decide, I want vehicle protection outside of loops. You can certainly put in a photo beam for vehicles. Just remember 
that if you're deciding to put in a device, an, a B1 or a B2, for entrapment protection, that's meaning people, it has to be monitored. You're still allowed to use non-monitored devices today, but those are strictly for vehicles. Well said. Yeah, and currently the one exception is barrier gate operators. If the barrier gate um, operator or the barrier gate itself does not come sorry, the barrier arm does not come within 16 inches of a fixed counter opposing edge, then you do not need to protect it. Can you define that monitor one more time for the, for the group? Yeah, so monitoring, th there's kind of, what, three different methods that are currently out there for monitoring. Um, there's a normally closed method. <clears throat> there's a 10K or 8K resistive method. Um, and there's a pulsed communication method, kind of a proprietary communication uh, or proprietary communication method. And what monitored is saying is that for that operator to function in a uh, you know, single push to open or single push to close, in other words, I'm hitting a button or an activating device and it just opens up, right? or I hit a button and it automatically closes. For it to work that way, um, it needs to have those monitor devices attached to the operator, okay? So the operator is actually looking for both the safety device is hooked up and that it's working properly. And that's one of the issues with some older legacy safety devices is if, let's say you didn't maintain the battery on the wireless transmitter for the edge. Well, then it didn't work anymore, but that gate operator kept running, right? And that won't happen today. Did I hit that right, Tim? Yeah, you did. I mean, basically what we're doing, we, we've installed photo beams and we've stalled edges for, you know, 30 years plus on gate operators. Um, the difference today, what we mean by monitored is starting in 2016 and clarified more in 2018, the gate operator has to physically see that these devices are working properly. In the old days of gate operators, if you put a gate edge on there and the battery died or the edge itself just got destroyed, that gate operator kept on working. It would keep on opening and closing without, wouldn't skip a beat. Monitored means that if it doesn't see the minimum amount of devices, the slide gate, that's two externals, one open, one close, if it doesn't see those, the gate's not gonna work. That's a big distinction, a big difference from prior to 2016. Just like garage door openers, if you have the photo beam at the bottom, that door won't come down if those photo beams aren't there. Same thing, it's monitored. The gate operator's looking for them. Yep. Yep, and uh, we're talking electronic, not human. You're exactly right. Okay, how many devices do I need? Okay, how many photo eyes am I going to add? You know, th this this slide really was built back in uh, in 2016, but uh, I think we've called it out. You need two independent means in each direction. Okay, with those exceptions that we previously discussed, and this is again to meet the minimum standards. Okay. Entrapment zone definitions were updated for slide gates, swing gates, vertical pivot, and vertical lift. Again, for the sake of time, we're gonna talk about slide and swing primarily, okay? So I think we've hit this, uh, we've hit this slide pretty well. Um, here's the slide gate and trap and zone definition. Um, and you can see where the definition starts to apply, okay? We talked about this rule in ASTM. In ASTM, it says, hey, between the gate and that uh, fixed post adjacent to the driveway, I've got to fill that gap. ASTM didn't say, hey, either fill the gap or put an edge up here. Okay, it said you got to fill the gap. UL comes in and says, hey, does that gate slide within 16 inches of a fixed counter opposing edge? Yes, it does. That's an entrapment zone. So this needs to be filled and protected. 
up to six feet above grade. Okay. Okay. If it's more than 16 inches, no harm, no foul. Draw and post, draw and post, draw and post. Okay, here's Tim's example. Uh, I think he already mentioned it, but you got to fill these gaps. They did a great job putting edges up. Got to, now you got to fill the gaps. Swing gate and trapping zone. Again, with, if it swings within 16 inches of a fixed object, you got to protect that area. Is a curb a fixed object? Um, I think some manufacturers would say it is. So be looking out for curbs as well. Okay, here's an example. Where are the entrapment zones here? Okay, we see the curb down there. And remember I mentioned the operator components? Okay, if those swing within 16 inches of a fixed uh, counterposing edge, you may need to, and you may need to protect that area as well. Hard to tell from this picture if that arm actually swings within 16 inches of that wall. But if it does, you would need to protect it. You can choose how you protect it, with it whether it's an edge or a photo beam. Okay. The bottom of the gate, this one, this one always uh, is a, a bit controversial, or it's a, always a good conversation. But if what this is saying is, if the bottom of your swing gate um, comes up higher than four inches above grade at any point in travel, you got to protect the bottom of the edge or the bottom of the gate. <laughs> okay. I know tough one in snow country, right? Another option would be not very secure, but you could put that gate, uh, you know, 16 inches above grade. In some cases that could apply. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily need to protect the bottom of the gate. Okay. They did change this in 2018 from six inches, I think it was, to four inches. Um, again, they're trying to minimize the number of, uh, how many numbers you got to memorize, right? You, get, you pretty much got four inches, two and a quarter, 16 inches. There might be a couple others in there, but those are the um, primary uh, measurements you need to remember. Okay. Tim hit this one in ASTM, but... Um, in UL, what it's basically saying, if you do leave a, a four-inch four um, surface or larger as the swing gate opens up against the column, you're going to have to protect it with an entrapment device. And I think a contact edge would be the, the primary way to protect that. Okay. All right, a little bit of review. Draw and posts. You could have a draw and post on either side of the gate, by the way. Right, as you see there. So these are, you know, pretty clear entrapment areas um, on this particular installation. Okay, they all need to be protected. Okay, just a little top view here, you know, as we move through. Um, the gate's closing, that leading edge is an entrapment zone, right? A photo I would do a great job protecting this area, okay? In the open direction, I might have an entrapment here where this gate slides past this fence line. A photo eye is gonna do a great job protecting that area, okay? Will this photo eye protect the draw-in post? No, it won't, because this photo eye is only in most cases, most operators, only uh, reacting if the gate's closing, okay? So my drawing post here is not protected. And either is either side of my gate operator. I've got a photo eye running across here, that's great. I got this photo eye really close to the operator, but is the gate, op is the gate gonna reverse if somebody gets trapped between the gate operator and the gate here, even if they hit the photo eye? Um, again, no, the answer is no in most cases. Some operators may have that functionality, but maybe some don't, okay? Some things to consider and get to know your manufacturer of choice very well. 
Hey, Colin asked the question on the swing gate, you know, where would you mount that edge? And um, on the bottom edge of that swing gate um, is probably where you're going to mount it. And you might have to mount it to one to both sides, depending on the logic of the operator that you're working on. Okay. So not the very bottom, I wouldn't say, unless it was a wraparound style edge, um, probably going to be on the face at the bottom. Good question. It, it also could determine on the gate operator and the logic that it uses, the manufacturer you're using. Exactly. You might need two and you might be able to get away with one. Correct. Okay, looks like there's some more questions on the swing gate, so I'm going to go back. Okay. Here's the slide for the bottom of the gate on a swing gate, okay? And if the, again, to clarify, if the gate is more than four inches above grade at any point, you gotta protect it. Odds are it is, right? If you've got any kind of slope, which you would have for drainage, uh, you might ride up above four inches above grade. If it does, technically, it needs to be protected, okay? Again, I think this is one of those areas where people make business decisions. I'm not recommending you don't protect it. I'm recommending you protect it, okay? But it is one of those areas. If you use photo eyes, um, if you use photo eyes, I don't have a top view here of a swing gate right now, but if you use photo eyes across the, from post to post, okay? And maybe even got one back here in the open area, that would not, uh, comply because you could have a big gap here in the middle of the swing uh, and those photo eyes would not be in play. You agree Tim? I agree. Um, make, just want to make sure that you know if you look at this slide it says if a contact sensor is being used as secondary entrapment. It's not saying you have to right? If, if there was a way you could design a photo beam so that it acted like did the same thing to protect that entrapment that the edge is doing, then that would be acceptable. But it would have to make sure you're protecting the entrapment zone. Thanks for calling that out. We've seen that, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. We've seen photo eyes mounted to the gate itself on either side, and that's perfectly acceptable. That is correct. Yep, you bet. How are we doing on time? Last 10 minutes. Right, we're about there. Okay, here's your swing gate. Okay. Um, again, just review uh, leading edge of the gate. I've got an entrapment down here on the latch post. I may choose to use a contact edge or wrap around. Okay. I may choose to use a photo eye to protect that wall if the gate or uh, operator components come within 16 inches of the wall. You bet. And here's some excerpts from some manuals on talking about how to protect. Uh, so you'll go through your manual specific to the operator you're installing and follow those recommendations. Um, Colin, you notice that they're asking for a, a photo beam here. <laughs> Is that to protect the curb or the operator? Yeah, I think it's, it's there to protect probably both in this case. Um, but I think if that curb wasn't there, you know, they'd be requesting you to put a, a, a photo beam there. Could I mount this operator, you know, 16 inches away from that gate when it's fully open? You may be able to, depending on the operator and the manufacturer. So that might be one design component that you take into play to eliminate uh, a device. Is that if, I, if I work on that off of that real quick, there, there are a lot of things in the design phase that can reduce entrapment zones. Um, and there's a certain individual I know that says, you know, if you design your gate system right, you really shouldn't have any entrapment zones. So work hard on the design phase to reduce as many of the entrapment zones as you can. Agreed. Agreed. Some excerpts from manuals, uh, again, showing how to use photo beams to protect slide gates. Uh, you'll see along the wall in this entrapment zone along the wall. Uh, certainly across the opening here, uh, I would call exception to the location of these. Again, those photo beams should be within five inches of the gate panel. In fact, the closer the better. No control zone. 
if you leave with the second thing or a third thing from this session, you will adhere to the no control zone. Okay, that means that you cannot install any access controls within six feet of any part of that moving gate. Okay, not a push button, not a service button, uh, no keypads. The no control zone is the cause of many injuries and deaths out there. Okay, so six feet. I will say I've seen manuals, installation manuals that say, I want them seven feet or I want them eight feet. So look at your, man, your operator uh, manual and make sure uh, and verify, but the, the standard UL standard says a minimum of six feet, okay? The manual is your, always your guide, but uh, this one's super, super critical. Hey, Zach, on this one, and you know this one is my absolute baby. This is the one I believe in the most. Um, the young man that was killed late last year, three major things were violated. One, there was a push button station mounted, you know, within inches of the gate. Two, the gate screening was improper. And three, there was no draw and post protection. All three were left out. He reached through the gate, activated the controls, and it sucked them in. Um, if we'd just gotten rid of one of those, but if we'd done all three of them, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking right now. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, well said. And here's some examples, right? No control zone. So the top picture, you see a keypad right next to the gate. I know that's convenient for, especially for a residential. Um, but, um, you know, remember that, uh, these are vehicle gates. They're not pedestrian gates. Okay. So those are violations. The bottom picture, same thing. Looks beautiful, but that's a violation of the no control zone. Okay. Top gate. Oops. Top gate, bottom gate. Those are okay. All right. I'm uh, on a gooseneck, you know, 12, 15 feet away. No problem. Warning signs. I'm going to roll through a few things here. Roll, warning signs. They're required uh, on both sides of the gate to be fixed on both sides of the gate. Okay. In the area of the gate, they don't have to be on the gate itself, but they need to be uh, permanently fixed so that they're visible from both sides. When you do your installation, this is an important thing to document, right? When you go through your checklist, document that you put them up, take some pictures, um, and save those in your files. When you go back to service that gate and the uh, homeowner or property manager has removed the safety signs, put them back up. Document that you put them back up and, and file that. And charge them for it, by the way. Tell them next time to uh, save, at least save the signs for you so you can put them back up, but those are required. Okay. Here's uh, uh, some typical depictions from manuals on swing gates. And you kind of see the same thing, swing gate on top, slide gate on the bottom. Again, they could be on the uh, fence line. Uh, I wouldn't put it on a fence line that the gate slides past, but um, I would absolutely on a swing gate, put it on the fence line. That should be perfectly acceptable. Pedestrian gates. Okay. Again, I don't like reading slides, but I'm gonna read this one um, to you. Pedestrians must be supplied with a separate access opening. The pedestrian access opening shall be designed to promote pedestrian usage. Locate the gate such as the persons will not come in contact with the vehicular gate during the entire path of travel. Okay. It's saying here is you gotta provide pedestrian access. It's not saying where that pedestrian access is, it's not saying that it's got to be a minimum of four feet away from the gate. It's saying that you got to provide pedestrian access and you got to promote it. Okay. I mean, I think it's a best practice to install a pedestrian gate reasonably close to that gate operator uh, to promote that pedestrian usage. And it cannot put you in contact with the gate as you're using it. Right. Uh, we'll show you a few pictures here. Tim, are there some questions coming up that I need? There to is. There's a, there's a good question here. Um, I'll just read it, you know, how does the industry perceive compliance? If basically just say I'm an integrator, all I'm doing is hooking up the access controls. I have nothing to do with the gate construction. I have nothing to do with the gate automation. My card reader is all I'm hooking up to it. 
um, do I have? Yeah, I mean, we're getting into um, a little grayer area than I'm comfortable talking about. Um, and I don't know that the industry necessarily does address that specific application where you're just the access controller, just the security person. Um, you know, my inclination is to say you've, you've probably got a defensible position, but I, I, I can't really comment. I would. I, I will it, say that, you know, I have seen many lawsuits start out where, you know, everybody and their brother is drug into court. You know, I've seen the asphalt guy, the landscaper guy, everybody brought in. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily found liable, but they are lumped in. Yeah, and you got to defend your way out of it. Maybe you get get away with not paying uh, any restitution, but you still got some like legal fees. Um, James asks, does that mean on a standard four leaf swing gate, we're required to install eight signs? So uh, like a bifold? Maybe a bifold gate, double, set of double bifolds. Right. Um, I could take that answer. The, the answer is no. You need one, one sign on each side of the gate that's clearly visible. Yeah. So in, in theory, if you had a double swing gate, or you know, you had a, a, a biparting swing gate, you would need two signs minimum, one on the inside, one on the outside. You could put four, but you would need two minimum. Yep, got it. And reading that verbiage verbatim uh, supports that. Okay, so here's your pedestrian gates. Um, again, top is an excerpt from a manual, um, kind of showing you where to place that pedestrian gate. And here's a, uh, a foul, all right? You cannot put the gate within the slide gate or swing gate. Regardless if you put a switch there to disable the operator, um, this is a no-no. And I see they violated the no control zone here too. I don't think I noticed that before. Okay. Swing gates into public areas. UL says, hey, you can't slide your swing gates into a public area like a sidewalk. I think I might have a pick of this. Yeah, you, this is a no-go. Can't do that. A um, couple of violations here. Uh, I always get a kick out of the fact it's swinging over an ADA mat. Um, that should be your first uh, clue that that's uh, not acceptable. I happen to know this site, it was at a police station and the AHJ was completely uh, adamant that this is the way it swung. And the installation uh, company decided to uh, capitulate. They're trying to save a, a parking stall on the inside. So. Okay, what we, we hit slides and we hit swings, but what about all these other types of gate operators? By all means, they all uh, need to comply in their own way. Uh, we don't have time to hit every single one, um, but refer to that manual. RTFM is the word or acronym of the day. Uh, make sure you're reading those manuals on the different types of operators that you install. Um, and, you know, I'll go through a quick quiz. If this was a live event, we'd be, uh, this would be a little bit more impactful, but you know, hey, as you walk up to this gate, what's your first impressions? Beautiful gate, beautiful house. We're violating a few things, right? You know, we're, we're possibly violating the no control zone within six feet, that access controls within six feet of the moving gate, right? Where are my warning signs, okay? That picket spacing looks a little bit suspect. There's a fourth one here. Drawing post, we gotta protect the drawing post, no ifs, ands, or buts, okay? What's wrong with this picture? Okay, couple things to point out. Back frame, it's not filled, that needs to be filled. That back frame slides past this post, which is a fixed counter opposing edge, okay? Up to six feet above grade. Here's the uh, little four inch violation right that swing gate beautiful install they put the warning sign in that's great but that gate swings up against that column technically that needs to be protected and most likely you're going to use an edge what's wrong here well i got some protrusions going on at the bottom i don't have a 
I don't have any warning signs. And Tim called it out, but how could I quickly fix this? Let's say I came up and I'm servicing a big job, or I don't know, this guy's got 20 gates out there and I want this contract. And every one of the gates has protrusions at the bottom. Hey, I might say, I tell you what, I'm gonna go, do, go through this for free. I'm gonna install some uh, a steel plate at the bottom to eliminate this protrusion, or, or heck, I'm gonna hack these off and install a, a, you know, a safety device. I don't know, I'm not telling, again, not telling you how to run your business, but those are an easy way to uh, remove those protrusions would be to potentially weld uh, you know, a plate to the bottom. Put a nice piece of uh, EPA hardwood on the bottom, it would look nice. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Well, we got our gate, pedestrian gate built into the slide gate. Looks beautiful, did a great job, but that's not acceptable. Okay, what do we got here? Well, we've got some protrusions. Um, all right, that'd probably be the main, uh, the main call out there. Okay, we are, uh, the swings up and over a curb. You know, we would technically need to protect for that. I actually do know of a case where a middle-aged man died on the curb with a swing gate. Okay. So that really um, concludes the session today. Man, we're one minute over. Not too bad. Um, do, do want to call out, again, National Safety Awareness Month. We've got a major special running on EMX right now. Huge discounts, actually, 18% off. So take advantage of that. There's only really a few days left uh, to do so. So um, by all means, uh, reach out to your local CPSG branch. And just want to call out a couple resources again. Um, AFA, NOMA, IDA, DASMA, all of these folks uh, have put a tremendous amount of effort into building these resources for us and, and perpetuating safety in our industry uh, through whether they're uh, certification or accreditation. So big call out to those folks. Tim, thanks for uh, co-hosting with me as always. We go way, way back, so uh, always makes it fun. We'll send out these post-webinar uh, resources uh, for you, including recording of the session, contact information for Tim and I, some, some links to these uh, organizations and accreditation organizations, uh, as well as other resources. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I think we stayed uh, kind of right on track. Great questions, by the way, uh, and hope you have a good rest of the day, good weekend coming up. There was one question, are the slides available? I wouldn't say the slides are available, but the webinar is available. Yeah, the webinar will be available, so you could probably you know, fast forward through that. Um, but reach out to me or, or Tim personally if there's something specific that you wanted to pull from that presentation. And for the 15th time, you've got our contact information there. Please feel free to reach out. I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. Absolutely. All right, folks, have a great rest of the day. I'm going to stop record, but I'm going to stay on if there are any additional questions. Same here. Um, Brandon asked, how do we get acknowledged for our um, CEU 